So thank you very much for waiting. And here we go. Um, Jan, you want to start with a company presentation? I think we just lost Jan for a second. Let me take over so far. Um, so um, just uh, so that you are aware of that, um, we have our blog at, at focuslabs.com slash blog, and you will find there a lot of interesting news regarding what's happening with SAP licensing, things that are changing, uh, like the digital access adoption program, which just was extended until the end of 2021. Um, other things that may interest you if you're um, active in this area of licensing. Now, our company is a German company. We've been on the market for the last 20 years. And uh, about the last 10 years, we've been very engaged in the area of SAP licensing. Uh, we purchased in 2014-15 a tool called SAMQ and the company that the manufacturer did, which helps us in those projects to measure, analyze the usage of SAP, both from the user as from the engine perspective, digital access, etc. Now we have completed our um, product portfolio with SAPQ, which is an interesting alternative to SAP access control. Uh, similar um, portfolio of um, functionalities. Look into it and if this is something that could uh, help you. Where are we active? We are active in the area of license, management, license and cost optimization with the tools. Um, the other area is segregation of duties management, which is access control, firefighters, uh, password management, roles, authorizations, compliance documentation, compliance management, um, compliance incident management, etc. And um, we are not only a tool provider. Our approach to the market and to our clients is we help you from the start to the end. We don't leave you with any reports there, but basically we help you in analyzing the usage of SAP and then um, starting something, uh, some activities based on those um, data that we get. What uh, could be defending your company in an audit, uh, helping you negotiate with SAP when you move over to S4HANA, when you have a major purchase with them, um, helping you understand your contracts, your uh, price levels, your special conditions, things like that. Same area on the compliance and security access uh, area where we can help you implement those systems. So um, clients we have basically in all branches, all business sectors, um, from automotive banking, insurance, uh, lots of retail, uh, food manufacturers, energy providers. Our clients, they go from 300 users um, to our biggest client, which has 1.2 million users in his systems. Um, we have around 400 clients today, uh, 300 employees. And the interesting part about what we do is we do more than 100 projects in a year. This is what um, provides a client with additional insight into the market the pricing situation than what he could uh, have alone by himself out of his own experience. So we complete your team with uh, additional tools and experience. This is the approach. So. Coming to um, SAP um, licensing, uh, let us uh, remember what we talked about in the last webinar. Um, SAP licensing is mainly users, engines, database, and digital access. And we have different um, aspects in a company that, um, that, that affect this um, licensing, like um, the, the security and compliance uh, rules that you have, uh, the necessity to, to stand to segregation of duties, uh, SOX compliance, things like that. Um, then you have cost management. So you are always driven to lower or keep your costs as, as low as possible. Um, on the other hand, you have um, steadily changes, new projects coming up, uh, new users, changing users uh, with staff rotation, reduction, extension, um, mergers and acquisitions, all things that have an effect on your licensing configuration. 
And um, this license configuration is defined apart from the metrics uh, by uh, the license demand, uh, by the purchased licenses, so your inventory. Um, what you have configured in SAP is mainly important because this is um, what will be measured in an audit. So we di differentiate between inventory, what do you have configured in SAP, and what do you really need? So how should SAP really be configured? And then over time you have metric changes. SAP changes metrics once to twice a year. Um, what is um, a managed uh, user? What is uh, uh, a revenue? How is revenue defined? Uh, how is uh, or a monitored user? Things like that. So um, the licensing models that exist are on-premise and perpetual or cloud and subscription or a mixture of both. Uh, you have your contracts and your terms and conditions. You have prices um, that change. SAP brings out uh, also one to three times normally um, a new price list every year, uh, which is not public. And um, then you have different levels of discounts that might go depending on the size of your company. I don't know, starting at zero and uh, going up to, I don't want to say 100%, but um, very, very tied to that. So um, let's start. Uh, this, this webinar is targeted to show you a bit about not the pricing basics, which we talked about in the last webinar, but more some specific problems, challenges that we are finding when negotiating with clients uh, and with SAP for clients. And, and so approaches on how you could solve those, those uh, challenges. So more practice orientated. Now, exposure of triple licensing. This is something that is coming up with the changes um, that um, are derivated from digital access. Uh, the thing here is, let's think about, for example, WMD, which is a, a typical uh, document management and provisioning application um, that is built on top of SAP. It's a portal solution. It's an example. There are hundreds or thousands of third-party applications that uh, use SAP as uh, a connector, a, a, a data management platform, but they provide data into SAP. Now you purchase this third-party application and it could also be a, a point-of-sale application. I just have another client who has a non-SAP point-of-sale application and those users in this third-party application, they also need to have an SAP user to be able to log in into the third-party application because this is the way the third-party application was built. It doesn't have an own user management, it just has uh, the SAP user management. So everyone working on this, let's say, point-of-sale system, archiving application, whatever, has a known uh, user license used to log on into the system. Um, then this application, in the case, case of the point of sale application, also produces digital access documents, in this case sales orders. Um, this um, point of sale um, supermarket tickets, they enter SAP as um, or receipts, they enter SAP as sales orders. And this way they produce, produce digital access and this is measured also as digital access. But on top of that, you have additional NetWeaver foundation for third-party apps um, licenses, which might be uh, user-based or instance-based, etc. Now, this is something that has come up over time, and SAP is building their passport uh, measurement system for digital access. And then in the audit, you, you have your users measured. Um, problem here is basically you're, um, you're licensing things twice and triple. Um, there is no technical way to solve this today. So the only thing that you can do here is uh, um, have your own documentation. 
explaining that you have groups of users, for example, your point of sale users, let's say you have a, um, a point of sale, an average of uh, five point of sale systems in every supermarket connected to um, SAP. So overall, let's say 500 users, and you have 500 user licenses assigned to them. You should maybe in your SAP system set up a, a um, proprietary license type, let's say 72. Uh, the custom license types are 72 to 79, as far as I remember, maybe it goes higher. And uh, you use one of them, assign this to your um, point of sale users to make sure that, that you, you have a documentation that shows this group of users is licensed with user licenses, but they are normally, they are third party application users or so indirect users. And um, then on the digital access part, make sure that you have a technical user only for this application so that you can segregate this and make sure that you can identify how much of what you're investing in, in this is, um, is being paid for that. Because you can decide to stick with the legacy licen licensing model, which is user-based, or move over to digital access. Whatever you do, don't pay it twice. SAP doesn't expect this from you, but as I said, there is no simple technical way to separate these kind of things. And it's, it is your responsibility to segregate this kind of licensing. So, moreover, SAP is offering you that if um, in the past you have purchased, let's say, limited professional user licenses, for your indirect users in these uh, third-party applications, you may now, as you move over to digital access, exchange those old user licenses for digital access document uh, licenses. Um, this is uh, part one. Part two, as you might uh, see here on this document, um, or do I have it? Users only indirectly accessing the SAP Digital Core. Um, and the, we are talking about user licenses considered for conversion to digital access, but also user licenses that are considered shelf work. What does that mean? That means if you today do an optimization with a, a tool like ours, or this of someone of their competitors, um, and you find out, well, I have a, a surplus of 50 uh, professional users or 1,000 or uh, 3,000 employee users, uh, licenses that you purchased in the past but are not using, this shelfware and can be now officially exchanged towards digital access. And this is something very important to understand because there is a big potential for optimizing your cost infrastructure with that. So, um, next uh, thing, um, changing users. Um, the thing here is basically uh, the same idea. Let's say you have people working, for example, a service engineer um, who is working on a mobile platform like a, 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 a smartphone or a tablet, and he's providing, um, he's entering um, sales orders or uh, purchase orders or material movements. Now, um, let's stick first of all with the um, process um, with, with the sales order. The thing here is um, we are talking about attaching documents um, or creating documents. And this is something very important. First of all, we have in the legacy licensing model, the orders, sales and service order execution is the product name or purchase order execution. Those orders in the legacy licensing model were created and you were paying a license for them. This is also a license that you can uh, be exchanging now towards digital access and um, with this, uh, avoiding to, to, to pay twice. And SAP officially allows you to do that. So um, this is the one side of it. Um, but since we have time until 2027 or 2030, if you pay some more maintenance, 
to move over to S4HANA and digital access, today still you should be um, well analyzing what is cheaper. Is it cheaper to be paying um, order licenses or do I want to stick with my user licenses for this kind of things? So number two is in some cases, this, uh, what did we call him, the, the service engineer, he doesn't create documents, he creates attachments. So um, let's say that he's, uh, for example, um, he's creating, uh, he's changing orders um, that have been prematurely created in uh, SAP. So someone, an SAP user, is creating an invoice in SAP. And now you have someone um, automatically um, scanning things or um, do a, a document scan or measuring products attached to an order and changes like that. Now, you must remember the digital access is uh, charged for uh, creation of documents, not for changes. So it is also here very important to understand are those people attaching um, some scanned documents to the original order and thus not creating additional licensing or are they creating a new invoice, a new uh, material movement, whatever, um, that, which is a different case. So um, sometimes in, in the old model, if you have uh, this old model, you had to pay for your sales orders. You had to pay for your users. If you stick, if, if you now move over to digital access, this is a document change and doesn't affect the process anymore. The, the original document is created by an SAP user. So you don't have digital access in this case. It is only a document change. So you, you are not paying orders anymore. You are not paying users in this case and you're not paying digital access. So in this case, the new model is uh, more attractive for the client with that. So another thing that happens very often, um, you define with SAP a proprietary user type. This is something many people don't know. SAP has uh, today, um, I think it is on the on-premise price list 2021, 20, user license types, plus four additional uh, user license types for uh, S4HANA and four additional for S4HANA Cloud. So um, some clients, especially very big uh, companies, but not only them, have decided, well, your user license definitions, they don't really match my needs, my specific demand. So I want to define a specific user license. Uh, let's say um, our company is Focus and we have uh, 3,000 users. So apart from the professional user and the employee self-service user, I want the Focus operational user, which is my own user type. And this guy is allowed to do this and that. For example, like in this case, uh, the special user administration in the decentralized area um, is a defined user whose rights are defined as for the release approval of orders, material removal and storage, view reports, my specific needs for a user. Any further use is chargeable and requires a separate written agreement with SAP. The problem here is you have defined something and you have done it to your best, with your best effort on defining a user, but you did a basic mistake, and this is you didn't include a standard user like the employees of service user. Um, try when you defined uh, proprietary user types to, on top of your specific needs, make sure that you include a lower level of user, but uh, that makes sure, first of all, um, that you stick to a certain pricing category, and, and secondly, that um, basic functionalities of, in this case, the employees have service user, but it could also be the employee or the worker, the logistics user, whatever suits you, are included in your specific license. And that when you move over your contract now to, from, from uh, ECC to S4HANA, that you take over these specific rights that you negotiated with SAP. 
Another thing, discounts should be protected. Now, um, if um, I have a process of negotiating with SAP for a full year or longer until we agree the me purchasing ECC plus extended warehouse management and my specific solutions for human resources, whatever my company needs, long, uh, tiring negotiating process, uh, discovering everything that I need. And we agree in a discount level. Uh, first of all, uh, I need to start earlier. Some clients don't know there are discounts. Yes, there are discounts. Basically, no one pays the list price. Very few clients do so. Those discounts are very different and depend on the client size. So, um, if I agree with SAP in me paying um, a 50, obtaining a 50% discount for this large deal that reflects like 80% of the needs of my company in ERP solutions, and we agree in 50%, um, make sure that you uh, bring in a, a contract paragraph that says this will be your standard discount now and in the future not only limited to the next 12 months 24 36 months like it usually happens um, in many contracts um, if you ask uh, a key account manager he will tell you well your discount level is based on the specific purchase that you're doing today Tomorrow, if you purchase much, you will get a high discount. And if you purchase little, you will get no discount. Um, this is basically BS, sorry. <laughs> Don't believe this kind of things. If, we, if I am a client that has purchased 10 million US dollars in licenses from SAP and somehow got to negotiate a 50% discount or even higher, I won't be negotiating anything below 50% in the next negotiation. Um, you want to have it on a written base? I would prefer to do so. Um, it's difficult. Sometimes you get it done and SAP accepts uh, writing it in your contract. Sometimes they don't. However, during the negotiation, just count on this being the basis for any negotiation you take. Don't start from scratch again doesn't make sense at all. So, um, yeah, uh, that's about it. Um, something uh, that is um, a very, very usual mistake. Um, you know that SAP has um, the automatic measurement engines and they have the, the self-assessment objects, as they call them. Um, so, automatic measurement is an engine that you can measure technically, yeah, like you have, uh, <clears throat> let's say, um, 100 users of human resources or, I don't know, um, I'll come with a better example. And a self-assessment engine uh, or object is something that is based on an external non-technical metric, like the number of employees of your company, the number of plants that you have, um, the uh, value of your assets uh, or the assets under management, your, your company revenue or your spending uh, or spending and revenue, it's, it's also another metric. SAP has today 50 different metrics, about 50 in their actual price list in 2020 for engines, uh, plus a set about 30 different user types. Now, um, those self-assessment um, metrics are not always very clearly defined. Uh, if we are talking about revenue, which revenue are we talking about? Now, imagine your company is a holding with 10 subsidiaries. And in fact, you're only using SAP to manage the business in three of those subsidiaries. So your total revenue is $100 million. Uh, and every subsidiary does 10. So in total, you are managing $30 million um, dollars of yearly revenue with SAP. Why in all the world would you be paying um, your metrics, your engine metrics for the full 100 million US dollars? Well, you shouldn't. 
but unless you get to define this in your contract you'll be paying for the hundred millions so make sure that you really um, expressly um, the limit in, in your contract what is being used what revenue are we talking about how many employees are we talking about don't start paying for your employees in china when you don't manage your business in china with sap uh, pay for, for for those in in europe in the us whatever suits uh, whatever fits here um, but make sure that this is clearly defined in the contract because by default it is not and this applies to employees to uh, revenues to many many things that can change your total SAP cost by 100%. So, very important thing here. Francesco, I can um, <clears throat> offer you a recent example uh, sure. of that exact point. Um, comes with a product uh, called Vistex, which is actually a third party product we sold by SAP. Um, typically, that, that product is only deployed in specific business units. So, if you have multiple business units, going to be using that particular software product when you're buying the software you should declare the revenue for only those business units and if it's rolled out to further areas of the business you would have to understand and be aware that further license fees are payable i had a customer that bought um, that product to a certain level of revenue for one of their business units but then the license metric in the contract was corporate revenue and therefore when it came to the license audit they had bought um, a level of entitlement for the business unit that was intended um, to use the software but come audit they had to then declare the full corporate revenue and the actual cost differential between the license level and the contractual license level they needed according to the metrics in the agreement as Francisco said the price difference was a million uh, and that's net of discount and that's because of not doing exactly what Francisco just said. So to be able to then, according to the, the revenue level, if they properly um, defined that in the agreements and the metrics for the product when they purchased it, the actual true up they would have needed for the level of use um, since they bought the product, I think it was about 250,000. So the difference in cost versus the license level they need versus what they need to be compliant technically according to the contract was about 750,000. So that's a great example of how a customer didn't do that and simply left themselves open to being charged more in the future um, according to that metric. So yeah, it's, it's a very valid point. Yeah, and, and, and as you said, uh, in, in your example, a million, that happens very often. I mean, this uh, discussions about metrics, I've seen clients um, having to uh, visit courts with SAP uh, for one single metric that was worth 20 million US dollars. So this is a real, real um, potential problem that we are talking about. Make sure you you uh, document and um, this appropriately in your in your contract. So another thing that we uh, came uh, come up with. Uh, make sure that you clear what will happen with mergers, acquisitions, divestments. So, um, first of all, it is by default so that SAP tends to write that you are um, you can transfer licenses from your company to another one with the agreement of SAP. Now, although SAP normally doesn't make trouble with that, um, in other cases they do. <laughs> so, what am I saying here? Um, you have a lot of engines and products in your contract that you can't separate into you can't divide them into so the problem is um, basic modules sometimes have to uh, be purchased twice uh, problem number one when you have such a divestment uh, of, of, of your company or separating your company into etc um, second thing let's think that you sell the half of your company to another company who's already using SAP. Now you don't need 50% of your licenses anymore from next year, let's say. Uh, there is no uh, single paragraph in your contract that will tell you, well, you're allowed if you do a divestment to um, lower your SAP yearly charges by uh, 
uh, the 50% or whatever is needed um, according to your usage needs. Um, so two points here. I would prefer to have this on a written base in my terms and conditions that I am allowed to um, transfer licenses to another uh, company, sell them over, so to say, with the agreement of SAP, etc. Um, or without the agreement of SAP, like it is the case in Europe, by the way, um, by default, um, but um, also to lower your bill as, as necessary. Now, to that point, uh, standard sentence of an SAP account manager, they must hear this in the first uh, day at, at work. Um, you can only cancel the full maintenance contract, you can't do a partial cancellation. Um, honestly, I've been hearing this from Oracle salespeople, Microsoft salespeople, SAP didn't invent it themselves. Um, it is possible to do a partial cancellation. Who in all the world could ask you to pay maintenance for products that are out of use? Now, of course, I'm not talking of the situation where you have 100,000 or 1,000, let's stick with 1,000, 1,000 professional users but you only um, use, uh, let's say, 950, and now you want to uh, cancel maintenance for the other 50. Uh, sorry, this is stupid. Um, no one can get to this precise level of management and cancel maintenance for, for a very, very low part of your contract. That's not what I'm talking about. But if you suddenly have, um, well, a crisis like we are at right now, exactly right now, and you have a, your revenue goes down and, and the, the amount of users that you have because goes down because you have to, to, to lay off employees. You suddenly have 1,000 employees less in your company. Why should you in all the world be paying maintenance for the licenses that you won't be using for the next five years? So there is a process that is called parking licenses. And parking licenses means you purchased a perpetual use right for those licenses, you, so you still have this use right, but you decide to um, stop uh, using them. So you stop paying maintenance for them. You come to an agreement, a written agreement to, with SAP to park a part of your licenses. What happens is if in the next two, three years, you decide to um, reinstate those licenses, well, you will have to pay are the past maintenance, which still is cheaper than repurchasing those licenses. So you could consider it. So after five years, 22% times five is already, uh, what is it, 110%, uh, so it's uh, more expensive than a new license. Anyway, um, depending on, on, on the number of years that you should be paying back maintenance, it can be if you get to pay back maintenance, which is the next thing, but um, you could decide to reinstate them or not. However, um, if you have a big change in your contract, if you have a big um, decommissioning uh, need for licenses because of layoffs, of uh, the crisis, of whatever, uh, this is a real possibility and consider this. I'm not saying SAP will welcome you with open arms and say, yes, uh, lower your contract how much uh, you want it to. No, that's not the way it works. I mean, as a software company, you are in trouble with every client going away. So you, you try to avoid this. I wouldn't do it differently, but um, be aware of the fact that you can do this kind of things. Mm, any ideas to that, Jan? To complete of course, this? yeah. <clears throat> yes, of course, by that particular model, your maintenance, uh, Base can only go up and unless you're smart with the way that you trade and swap um, unused software for, for new products, in, in essence SAP are saying that your maintenance cost, your maintenance contract isn't for the software you're actually using but actually for all the software you've ever owned and it just keeps totting up and up and up and up. I mean things that you can look at are things like um, if you have 20 contractual exhibits four of which contain software you're not using. If, if anyone's familiar with a, an SAP order form, you have the schedule of the licenses, 
And on the order form, it will stipulate the maintenance uh, fee associated with the licenses that you've bought. If you terminate that exhibit, you're also terminating the uh, maintenance uh, contract for those licenses as, as well. And so uh, your license, uh, your actual um, maintenance fees could go down. Um, another way of doing it is looking at a selection of products you're not using and looking at demand over the next three years. And if you can get credit for unused software towards future spend, in essence, what you're doing is just transferring the maintenance base from unused software to new software that you're buying. So you would have a capex cost to that, but at least the respective maintenance base increase wouldn't be as great. So there's, there's things that you can do. So as Francisco said, um, it's not true that your maintenance base cannot go down. Um, and there's other things you can do to kind of leverage that in negotiations. Obviously, the threat of going to third party support maintenance in order to save costs where, where cost savings are required. I've seen customers use that to good effect. And basically, it all boils down to negotiation in that situation. So there's certainly things that can be done. Um, but like um, Francisco said, it's, it's very important to be, be aware of um, you know, what to listen to and what not to and what, what you can actually achieve. Exactly. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is negotiating. You, you get a lot of information. Not of, all of it is true. It's, it's sometimes objective. It is uh, tendentious to, to drive you in a certain direction. So don't take everything for granted. Don't take anything for um, unchangeable when you hear about those things. Now, another thing that we find, uh, typical example, the SAP limited professional user. An SAP limited professional user is a professional user that is limited in some obscure way that you should be defining in your contract. The limitation could be the color of the hair of each user or their uh, bodily uh, height or whatever. Um, so what am I saying here? This was a, an interesting user that you could, uh, was uh, relatively cheaper than a professional user and you could adapt it to your needs. It doesn't exist in SAP's price list anymore. Uh, now, um, if you have one single unit of it in your contracts, in your past contracts, you can still purchase it. If you don't, you can't. So what I'm saying here is make sure you have your main user types, like the self-service user, uh, the logistics project worker user, the employee, um, and the professional one, and if possible, the limited professional one, have at least one unit of each. This has um, two consequences. First of all, uh, if those users um, are let um, fallen out of the um, uh, let fall out of, of, of the price list, you will still be able to purchase them. Uh, number two negotiating a change of quantities is much easier if you already own those users. So let's say you have an, a surplus of professionals and need more employees, it will be much easier to negotiate that you change the amounts but not add additional products that you don't have in your contract. Now, if you have those um, user types in your contract, you can also bring in a paragraph in your contract that says, um, for the next five years, I'll be allowed to exchange the amount of users um, of these uh, user types as long as the maintenance doesn't go down. If you now uh, bring in the thought that for one professional user, you might be getting, I don't know, 50 self-service users, um, then uh, this will help you prevent having any audit findings in the user area eventually in many occasions and this way uh, preventing to have additional spendings. So also um, something that still very few companies do and something that you should consider including in, in your SAP contract. Um, well, and so um, one more thing to that. Very few people still know, that's my uh, impression at least, about S4 HANA cloud licensing and the so-called full usage equivalents. 
Now, um, in S4 HANA Cloud, uh, which is a, a subscription-based uh, licensing, SAP already is trying new things. And trying new things means you have now four user types, like on S4 HANA on-premise, the developer, the advanced, the core, and the self-service user. And the rule is here, you don't buy any users of those types, you buy full usage equivalents. So a professional user, which is called in this case advanced use, is one full user equivalent. Um, and uh, developers uh, 0 0.5, so you need two full user equivalents to have one developer user, or you get, um, let's say, this kind of something uh, between the limited and the employee, which is the core use, you get three of them for one full usage equivalent. Um, the thing is, you buy like a total amount of units of full use equivalent, which you might exchange as, as it fits you during the year. Uh, now, this is extremely interesting, uh, an interesting approach would love to see this um, also with the on-premise users. Um, what am I saying here? Well, if SAP is already uh, exploring and experimenting with these much more modern uh, license types, much more flexible license types, um, why shouldn't you be doing the same on-premise? What I'm saying is lead your negotiations as to understand that this is something self-explanatory and that is if, if I overall spent two million dollars in user licenses, I don't care about the configuration in the negotiation. I would say however those two millions are configured, if it is 1,000 professionals and 50,000 self-service employees, or if it is the other way around, like uh, 2,000 professionals, and as long as I'm within the borders of the value that I purchased, I would be lucky with it. I, would, uh, I wouldn't have trouble in negotiating that, but auditors do have trouble with that. And they, they need to stick to certain rules, and the rules is you can all, always balance a lack of user licenses with higher type user licenses never the other way around. Um, I would discuss very much about that. If I have an excess of, let's say, uh, a million dollars in self-service user licenses that I never got to use, and I'm missing, um, let's say, 50 professional users, I've never ever paid for those 50 professional users. And some key account managers, some uh, auditors, they find this um, comprehensible, others don't. So take care of this. I mean, uh, you have a chance to negotiate this and, 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 and not get into so much trouble with that, not pay for, and not, not be paying when you already have anyway spent more than what you're using which is not always the case. Of course, we find many clients with uh, sub-licensing and a need to um, purchase additional licenses. But when you have a license surplus, make sure you use it to your advantage too. Anything to, to add to that, uh, Jan? Uh... Yes, sorry, on mute. Um, yes, it's a very interesting um, mechanism they have for cloud user types where in essence, you're buying one entitled level for user licenses, and they break that down into full use equivalent, and you can have any configuration of professional, functional, or productivity users, as long as the configure as long as the configuration of those users falls within that license level. So, in essence, you aren't actually buying individual user licenses; you're just buying uh, the, the right level. Of, entitlement um, to license your business. So it's interesting how customers should be looking at the same um, the same structures, the same license management structures for on-premise licensing. Um, and customers really who are not optimizing uh, user licenses, so aren't using a tool like SAMQ, for example, to optimize the classification of users, might end up acquiring or purchasing licenses um, well in excess of what they need. And of course, the license level would be well above what they actually need, and they end up having paid more for the licenses. Um, if you take a simple optimization model, 
and you have the right entitled level, then the user licenses you're consuming within that should be optimized and therefore saving customers a lot of money. Um, so there are things you can look at in terms of that model that could be applied in principle um, to on-premise license management. Um, but it shows that SAP are starting to look at how flexible license models um, you know, is, are what customers are looking for going forward. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, um, so far to that um, for today, um, one of the next things we need to be talking about is um, um, cloud licensing, which we, will be one of our uh, next uh, things uh, to start talking uh, about. So um, now conclusions and, and things to remember. Uh, special licenses um, were something, a, a difficult negotiation that many, um, well, achieved with high, with big success, uh, finding a price uh, adaption, a functionality adaption to your specific needs. If you already achieved this in the past, don't miss out to take this over into S4 HANA. Again, you might find, sorry, a, a less experienced a key account manager who tells you this is not possible, whatever, don't believe that. You can negotiate whatever uh, is necessary. And if this is important for your company, and if you find that the standard user types don't really reflect your situation, then uh, stick to that and, and take this over into S4HANA. Now, uh, definitions uh, should always be available clearly. Um, download from SAP the uh, SAP user types.xls uh, file that defines use rights um, to um, take this, this user definitions, use right definitions as a basis and then adapt them if, if necessary. Now, um, when defining special users, um, make sure that the general rights are also uh, defined as uh, perpetual, um, you're buying perpetual licenses, then also those rights should be perpetual. And um, think that although in, in the practical world this is not always happening, SAP's policy is the one of um, having a client paying for things that they are really using. And they have a lot of policies to let you exchange shelfware to let you exchange shelfware for digital access. When moving over to s you have the contract conversion that allows you to get rid of all your shelfware, whatever engines you purchased in the past that you are not using might be exchanged for um, active licenses that are useful for your company. So SAP is really supporting that. It doesn't mean that every um, um, every every key account manager of SAP jumps in happiness when you tell him you'd rather exchange uh, instead of buying, um, which is natural, of course, but SAP's policy is to support you in, in doing this kind of thing, so um, ask for that. Uh, consider what things you have in your contract that you don't want to be paying twice for and then maintenance that you're paying that you want to get rid of, things like that. So, um, still got five minutes. I'm come to, to our ending. Um, so I just I, noticed, Francisco. Yeah. Oh, so, sorry, Francisco. I was going to say, I just noticed we do have a question. What? Sorry? Sorry, but, I just, I, we received yeah, a question. Some, uh, that's what I was uh, going to say. You can use our platform. To, to send us some questions, and we already have some here. Um, what is the difference, is someone asking, between parking licenses and terminating licenses with SAP? Well, you must very, be very careful upon the definition of what is parking. There is no um, official definition to my knowledge. I have seen different uh, ones. Um, there are different aspects. If you consider um, parking. Parking is deactivating maintenance for a group of licenses. So let's say you purchased, I don't know, um, you wanted to, to implement human resources and you never got to it, so you have a lot of human resources licenses that you're paying maintenance for. Uh, you want to get rid of this maintenance. 
you park the licenses. This means uh, the attachment that uh, the, the contract appendix that you had defining human resources purchases, it is decommissioned and it is parked. And parked means you could reactivate it in the next um, two or three years, um, officially paying back maintenance and officially maybe not. And um, you could re restart using those licenses. This is one part of the parking agreement. Part number two is you don't pay maintenance from now on for that part, since you won't be using the, um, the, the licenses. SAP doesn't allow you to park licenses. Um, although you have a perpetual usage uh, right, if they are parked, SAP doesn't allow you to use them. But on top of that, now let's assume you park them now five years and in 2025 you uh, do a contract conversion towards S4 HANA. Now those parked licenses, they count towards your contract conversion. If they were worth a million, you can now exchange them for a million of um, S4 HANA licenses. So this is the difference between a termination. The final termination means you will never get money for them again. Um, now, there is also a difference when, when uh, negotiating those agreements with SAP uh, in, the, in the aspect of, have you ever used these licenses? And now you um, replaced, uh, I don't know, uh, your human resources, SAP human resources system by Workday and uh, decommission them and park them, uh, you had a usage, you had uh, something worth for your licenses, or you purchase HR, but you never got to implement an HR system. So they, they are new, they are not used, they, never, they, they were never used. This puts you, of course, in a stronger negotiation position. It is not a used car, it is not a used license anymore. It is something that for some reasons you never got to implement. So you paid SAP for something that never got to enter use. So how long can parking of, parking of licenses be done? Not defined. Um, I think um, probably the, the, the things that I've seen for park licenses were something around three to five years after what the client maybe did a conversion and exchange, whatever. Um, but um, then some clients uh, forget about them and they are not part of the contract anymore. There is no official answer to that. Negotiation based is most of things. It's, so it's we correct. Have a, and, yeah, Francisco, it could, it could be for any length of time, but it's it's relevant to the point you made earlier, which is after after three years or so, it's actually more expensive according to the kind of standard um, constructs of our, of the parking. Um, concept, um, it would be more expensive to switch them on after three years and pay the back maintenance than it would be to um, just buy the, the licenses net new. Um, I don't know if it's exactly three years, but what you have to do is, is at any point, if you're switching licenses back on, you would simply have to look at, is it going to be more expensive to switch them back on and pay the back maintenance, or would it be cheaper just to buy the licenses again? And in some cases, if part, licenses have been parked for a long time, it is actually cheaper to just just terminate them and, and buy them net new. Yeah, um, I'm getting another question, which is interesting. Um, I fear I won't have enough time to answer it completely, but uh, please contact us. Is there any special definition that we can get from SAP for indirect usage rights in a new contract? Um, yes and no. Um, normally, SAP contracts, um, they, they have a, a link to the SAP use rights, and um, those use uh, there is a use rights document uh, which defines what is digital access, what is indirect usage. Then there are several documents that have been published since 2018 uh, by SAP. There is a portal um, within SAP, or let's say a group of pages in SAP's help, which is called SAP Digital Access. Um, so, um, you need to look into the price and conditions list, which is a public document. It doesn't contain prices, it just explains prices and metrics. Price and conditions list, 
digital access publications and your use rights, all these three sources define digital access. And um, my advice also here is adapt this to your needs because there is clearly um, uh, that is clearly not enough. Every company has different use cases, different situations, and you really need to define and agree with SAP if this use case with your point of sale systems, your non-SAP warehouse management that produces that and this document, how is this licensed with SAP? And you need to have a confirmation, written confirmation by SAP that this is correctly licensed and that no additional costs will come up in the future for that. This is my opinion to it. This is an, a, a personal opinion. So don't stick only with SAP standard definitions. Let them really confirm that they won't come up in, in, in five years from now and ask you for additional money for this uh, third party solution that you connected to SAP. And with this, I need to say thank you. Um, I got a, an adjacent um, meeting. Uh, thank you very much for participating. Uh, please feel free to contact us personally, uh, Jan, me, Peter, uh, with your questions, with your requests. If you need support, uh, we'll be glad to be in contact with you and support you with your um, open issues, open questions. And, and in your projects and your negotiations with SAP. Thank you very much. Wish you a very successful week. Thanks, everyone. Well.